Welcome to Impact Unicorns, the podcast where you meet inspirational entrepreneurs building the next generation of transformative companies. And now, here is your host, Dr. Indranil Ghosh, award-winning author, investor, and advisor to global leaders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Impact Unicorns. Today, I'm delighted to welcome John Salazar to the show. Originally a native of Madrid in Spain, John has worked around the world and is currently the founder and president at Gazelle Wind Power in Dubai. Gazelle is developing a new technology to reduce the cost and to increase the durability of floating offshore wind arrays. Floating offshore wind can be deployed at large distances from the coast where the strongest and most consistent winds are to be found. And as such, it's a key growth sector in the renewable energy market. John, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's a real pleasure to be here today, Indranil. Thank you for taking, taking the time to have me here. John, uh, I'm delighted to have you on the show for many reasons. You're the first guest that we've had from the United Arab Emirates, where you're currently based. Obviously, the UAE holds a soft spot in my heart uh, since I was there for several years at Abu Dhabi as, uh, as head of strategy at Mubadala. And, uh, you know, the place is extremely dynamic, uh, keeps reinventing itself. So must be a great place to be. But, you know, as with all of our guests, I'd love to start by unpacking your journey. How did you get to the UAE? How did you begin your uh, amazing venture, which is Gazelle Wind Power, uh, which is pioneering the field of uh, floating offshore wind? Um, I know that you started off life in Madrid in Spain, worked in consulting, in, in energy, and you've now conceived this amazing project. Tell us a little bit about how you got there, because people don't just wake up one morning and decide to you know, start an impact uh, venture. It's a difficult, hard, audacious task. How did you build up to that? No, indeed, Indranil, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I, I've always been um, uh, very independent in my way of thinking. Um, I started uh, back then in Madrid uh, doing uh, small deals when I was at a very young age. Uh, I could be 16, 17, uh, 18 year old. And uh, for example, I could buy a, a large package of CD boxes and do some arbitration with that. Or on a rainy day, uh, I could uh, get umbrellas and uh, sell that. So very small, very small deals. Um, but that um, signs of um, being an entrepreneur were already there. Um, I was always very pushed uh, towards my studies. As I now say in another life, I was uh, an engineer. and. Um, that's also how I got into Gazelle, into what we are doing now. While the company was founded last year, and we're moving very, very quickly, we're progressing very quickly in this venture. This is a result of over 12 years of research and development uh, from a genius, from Dr. Antonio Garcia. Um, he was champion of the Mathematical Olympics uh, in Spain in the 70s. Uh, maybe you've heard of the America's Cup sailing competition. In, in the three editions that Spain uh, was participating, he was the lead engineer uh, for the mm -hmm. Spanish team. So uh, I've been for for the last uh, almost all my life inspired uh, by this by this person that he inspired me to become an engineer. I've been following this industry while at a very early stage for the last decade, and that's how I got into Gazelle. It's been indeed a process uh, with different ventures, uh, career in the corporate world as well. Uh, failures, also some successes up to this point. If you're enjoying Impact Unicorns, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the bell to receive notifications of new shows to bring the most relevant Impact Venture stories to the podcast. If you would like to review the show, go to the Apple Podcast mobile app or iTunes to leave a rating and review. No, terrific. Uh, I'm really curious as to how, um, you know, you made the decision to start Gazelle. I mean, you've been following it, presumably thinking about it for a long time. You had a comfortable, very successful career. And then suddenly, you know, the big jump. Um, or was it a big jump? Is it something that built up gradually? Tell us a little bit about how that 
first venture came to be? Well, very straightforwardly, I started Gazelle because I wanted to I wanted to help uh, the inventor, uh, the genius behind the concept. As I said before, um, I was following how the industry was evolving uh, for the last decade, and we as investors we don't invest in technology; we invest in business models. So after uh, seeing how the inventor um, wanted to develop the patent. Uh, up to a commercial state, I had no chance that um, taking the project and start a business around that concept. I had already a group of businesses that were running well, uh, allowing a, a very good lifestyle. Um, but I started because I wanted to help him. That's how it all started. Now it's a total different story in Ranil. Now uh, we are at a point where uh, we've been able to fundraise successfully. There is uh, very well-respected industry leaders um, as part of our board of directors. In fact, I believe one of the, one of these, our chairman, was in your show recently. Yes, Javier. Uh, we're, having one, we're having him on our, on our show very soon. Um, recorded that episode just uh, last week, actually. He's uh, he's your chairman, Javier Cavada, CEO of uh, of Highview. That's right. It's uh, it's an honor to have Javier as chairman. He's a mentor to me, and he's he's a star. He's he's an industry leader, very inspiring. Um, so I, at this point, um, having already um, succeeded in this those first milestones, this now is something that goes beyond myself. That's the feeling mm -hmm. I have. Uh, to to say it in simple words, um, what I want you to hear uh, in the next five ten years when you see floating structures. I don't want you to call them wind turbines, floating wind turbines. I want you to call them gazelles. That's the intent that this company has. And at this point, uh, we are an enabler. That's what we feel. We are an enabler to unlock a massive opportunity. And I feel now this this goes beyond myself, goes beyond the board, goes beyond our shareholders. It's our responsibility with the world uh, mm. to keep pushing and to introduce this technology into the market. So it started by helping a person, and now it's it's something that goes beyond. Yeah, it's very interesting how you described this. It started off not necessarily as a business venture. It was a passion. It was a personal um, intention of yours to help a friend, which then has become a business and with the aspiration of actually having transformational impact, which is what we always talk about on this show. I think that's really something important for listeners to sort of reflect on is, you know, a lot of the people that we talk to actually start first and foremost by pursuing a passion, by pursuing a, you know, a desire to help someone, uh, help solve a problem, um, you know, before it becomes this big unicorn business. And I think that's a good place for these things to nucleate. But at the end of the day, it is a business. So tell us about the market opportunity, because you know, I think everyone has heard of uh, wind-generated power. It's an important part of our future. But it breaks down into onshore wind and offshore, and then within offshore, there's, you know, fixed structures or wind turbines which are actually floating in, you know, deeper in the ocean, or far further out from from shore in the ocean. You know, tell us a little bit about how this market's going to evolve. What's the how big the relative segments are going to be, and and why is on offshore floating wind so important? That's a very good question. So. For us, this this market, uh, it's it's a no-brainer. It's very obvious for several reasons that we can discuss now. So the market starts as um, onshore. Everyone has seen these onshore structures, particularly you are in Europe. Or maybe you were traveling to the countryside and you see these big trucks with these very large structures um, being transported. So that's that's where the industry comes from. Now, uh, the industry has been moving uh, towards offshore. And when we speak about offshore, uh, we have fixed, fixed bottom on one side, on the one hand, and floating on the other one. Fix has been uh, developing um, for the last, last decade, the last years. And these are structures that are very near the coast, very, very near the coast. They are uh, installed into the seabed. So you cannot have them very, very far away or, or more than far away on deep sea waters uh, because it becomes very expensive and very, very challenging for installation as well. So that's why, um, bear in mind, to provide a context, once the best onshore sites are 
are, are being taken. That's already happening in Europe. And once the best six bottom sides uh, will be taken also. Also, they have several social issues. Uh, if you have, and, and we've seen some cases, if you are developing real estate um, and, and these type of structures um, are installed in front of uh, your, your uh, real estate, your properties, that they're not going to be very happy that happens. Uh, so uh, when you go uh, on deep sea waters, and we call this beyond 60 meters in depth, uh, something very interesting happens uh, because the, the wind is more strong and more constant, which leads to higher capacity factors. And also when you go away from 20 kilometers, you, there is no visual impact. So that's why uh, we see, and there are some studies that says that say that uh, over 63% of wind resources and on deep sea waters beyond 60 meters. That's why we, we see that this market, uh, it's said to be the fastest growing market within renewable energy within the next decade, floating offshore wind. That's a really incredible perspective. So, you know, we're familiar with onshore wind and the zoning problems that that causes because it can be a little bit of an eyesore, but, you know, it's for a good cause. So, you know, we accept some of it, you know, offshore, um, you know, th there aren't always perfect sites everywhere on the, along the coast. You have to find that sort of relatively shallow uh, sea bottom relatively close to the coast where you can tether these uh, large wind turbines. So in fact, it is quite a limited set of real estate, if you like, where you can build these, these uh, near shore um, uh, wind, wind turbines. But when you open up the whole offshore market, which is where the wind is stronger and more constant, as you say, which has also good implications for uh, the grid, because you are supplying more electricity more of the time and helping reduce some of the intermittency issues that you can get onshore, certainly. Um, you're beginning to solve a lot of the, the problems of limited sites and the, the constancy and the, and the strength of the wind. So what are some of the challenges, though? Because now you are offshore. You have to transmit that electricity onshore. I'm not sure if you know you can build the same size turbines and everything. So walk us through what some of the challenges are and how people are beginning to overcome those. Oh, for me, I will highlight like, uh, three challenges in Dranil. Uh, the first one is is exactly what you are highlighting now, uh, which is to have the technology in order to be able to put these structures, uh, providing a stability on very rough seas. Because once you go beyond these 60 meters in depth, you can be in very rough seas. So the first, the first challenge is to have the technology um, that can enable to have these very large structures. No? Imagine uh, 150 meters in height structure or more uh, floating in the middle of the sea, being stable because if, if it has pitch, if if it is it 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 if it if, if this starts uh, tilting tilting, yeah. um, the wind turbine will stop. Uh, so in order to keep the operations, this must have a very high level of stability. Um, that's where, uh, that's what we're doing exactly. We are a technology provider uh, in order to put on the water uh, these very large, vast wind turbines and, and provide almost a null tilt so that it can run. So the first challenge would be um, in terms of providing the technology, also all the moorings. There is a big challenge in the industry to solve that to enable mooring systems able to operate for 20, 25 years. That, that's one of the big challenges in the industry. So the first one would be the technology. A technology enough to lower the capex, the current capex of the actual demonstrators that are out there, uh, which ultimately lead to uh, a decrease in the levelized cost of electricity. That's the main trigger. Now, in order to reach to utility scale level, there are other challenges as well that need to be addressed. Uh, the supply chain, uh, needs to catch up in order to not just uh, build a demonstrator, but being able to put, for example, for a 500 megawatt offshore wind farm, uh, 50 of these structures of 10 megawatt unit each or, or even more as the market is growing and growing more. So the whole supply chain needs to be ready, needs to evolve in order to um, face this type of challenges. The, the last point, the third point uh, would be to have a clear national roadmap. We need to know how many gigawatts by when uh, from the local authorities. Uh, this will give enough certainty uh, to the whole supply chain in order to make the investments required, in order to make this technology competitive 
with with the other uh, sources of electricity and future systems uh, to reach that carbon zero goal. Over the past 20 years, I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs to build impact unicorns. In my experience, every company that has a transformative positive effect on the world does so by building strong partnerships with communities, investors and governments to solve society's biggest challenges. If you'd like to learn more about how innovative entrepreneurs can help to build a more sustainable and inclusive future, read my award-winning book, Powering Prosperity, A Citizen's Guide to Shaping the 21st Century. So let's just go through that. There's some very interesting uh, qu questions here. So now you've got this large 150 meter structure. Uh, first of all, you have to make it float on the surface. You have a large cable that hold, you know, goes from the, the structure down to the seabed that holds it steady. At the same time, it can't tilt and sway too much because that could lead to damage. Um, you have to organize this in an array. So the whole supply chain of not just the turbines and everything, but all of the ships, all of the um, marine technology, you need to get all the various components up out there. You have to do, you know, uh, in the sea construction, right, which ha has its own challenges. So that's just the technology and the supply chain side. And then, as you mentioned, there's also the, the electricity planning with the local authority. How much do you build? How did they keep the grid stabilized? And probably another question is, you know, you, you now several hundreds of meters, if not kilometers away from the shore, you have to have uh, transmission cables to connect the, the wind array to uh, the grid on land and transmit that electricity to centers of demand. So uh, let's go a little bit deeper into, you know, how much you know, effort it's gonna take and what you're seeing to, to overcome some of these challenges. You know, just simply the technology first, I know that's where Gazelle is excelling. You know, what are you doing that's a bit different? Um, how are you seeing the supply chain and the rest of the industry coming along to be able to support large-scale deployment? And what are you seeing in different local authorities, different countries around the world in, in their support of uh, the floating offshore wind paradigm? So first of all, um, there are uh, several concepts out there trying to solve this, well, this, this challenge. Um, you may have heard of uh, tension leg structures. Uh, this work in a, in a way similar to what you described. Uh, you have that, that uh, structure. Uh, this can be made of uh, steel or other materials uh, with, these, with these cables that are fixed to the bottom. Um, this is one type. This has their own challenges uh, because in order to keep this stable, these, these cables need to resist very high mooring loads, very high tensions. So that, that was one of the early, early solutions. The other uh, more um, uh, conventional or more, most of the conventional platforms out there uh, are based on what's called semi-submersibles. Uh, semi-submersibles are, are floating structures. Um, they provide the floatability and the stability by growing in size. They are very large, very large structures. Um, these have um, lower stability, uh, they have large lateral movements, impacts on the export cables, and normally require dry dock or, or special fabrication yards in, in order to be to be um, to be deployed. Um, you can search about more about the concepts. You may hear about the spars as well. Well, um, what we are doing at Gazelle is something completely novel. Um, what we are doing is combining the benefits of the semi-submersibles and these tension like platform structures by significantly reducing the challenges. What we see is um, the way the problem is being solved out there, which is by growing in size, uh, we believe that's, that's the problem because that leads to a very high capex and, and ultimately it's not reducing the LCOE. Uh, so what, what we've done at Gazelle, what makes us uh, so unique is we, we have separated the floatability and the stability. And the hull of the platform provides the floatability while the mooring system, which is patented and is now certified by the DMB, which is uh, world is one of the world's leading uh, accreditation societies, uh, provides the stability. So that's why that's the way Gazelle is solving this problem, and this is leading to um, significant cost reductions. That's what we assume. We can use 70% less steel 
than some of the conventional platforms out there uh, with the same scale of one of, of these conventional platforms when come manufacture three. This has huge impact uh, in Dranil in terms of uh, reducing the capex, uh, that impact in the LCOE, and also in terms of CO2 emissions, just by reducing the amount of steel, we can reduce 650 kilotons per gigawatt uh, installed based on this. Um, so this is um, the broad view of how these these concepts are figuring out figuring out the solution. Um, there are other challenges, and to fully to fully uh, address your question, uh, imagine for example a 500 megawatt offshore wind farm with 50 of these structures, and imagine all the, for example, for the conventional semi-submersibles, all the catenaries. These catenaries can be of two kilometers of, of chains, each of these catenaries. And as you as you clearly pointed out, at the end, this needs to be connected to the grid, it needs to be connected to a substation, and ultimately uh, connected to, to the grid so it can, it can distribute the electricity. Mm. One of the highest risks we see uh, isolated exactly to, to to this umbilical and all the moorings. I mean, a situation with all these currents uh, out there, uh, all the operations, all the maintenance. And um, that's something that we at Gazelle, uh, as we are using a completely different solution, um, our, our mooring uh, lengths, these chains, they don't need to be two kilometers. We can just use 25% uh, of this. So we can just use 500 meters. So that significantly reduces this risk of accidents. We don't need to use also very thick cables because our solution is not fixed to the bottom. It's not it's, it's not installed to the bottom. So we don't damage we don't damage the seabed. Uh, it's a floating structure, and uh, we don't need to use these very uh, very heavy cables. We just need to use uh, up to 25% of the of the mooring loads that the standard TLPs have. Mm, ultimately, you need to do all this to keep this stable, and that's what that's where we excel. Uh, imagine that this type of um, wind turbines are they normally operate between 35 kilometers per hour and 90 kilometers per hour, and after that they, it, it shuts down. But if there is too much tilt, um, you will not be able to operate it. So uh, for us, keeping almost a null tilt, uh, less than one degree tilt. Uh, that's that's what we're aiming for. That's why, while being a startup, uh, we have the interest of multi-billion dollar market cap companies at this stage, uh, because they've never seen a floater that for a 10 megawatt unit um, weighs less than 2,000 tons and is able to keep a tilt uh, of less than one degree. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well, that must be quite uh, transformative. And tell us a little bit about the, the unit economics. So once uh, you've uh, gone through the technology development phase, at what cost would you expect to be, in terms of CapEx, be able to uh, put up one of these structures or perhaps it's the capital expenditure by megawatt? How, how would that compare with current offshore wind or even onshore wind? In terms of CapEx in Dranil, what we are seeing is these demonstrators uh, close to the 10 megawatt units out there um, can be as part of projects between 50 and 60 million euros. Of course, these are demonstrators. And as we learn from these demonstrators and the supply chain keeps evolving, we expect uh, significant uh, capex reductions. That's why we need to address these challenges we said before in order to make uh, floating offshore wind competitive within the next decade. Um, we should be reaching that uh, 40 to 60 megawatt per hour um, uh, see, uh, we should be reaching that uh, 40 to 60 uh, euros per megawatt hour in order to make this technology competitive. Yeah, and I think that would be uh, an excellent achievement given the the development times involved here in terms of not just the technology development and the demonstration projects, but waiting for the supply chain to catch up so that you can make these large scale deployments, which are very large projects and themselves take multiple years to actually come to fruition. Um, but the good news seems to be that you've assembled a, an outstanding team um, and also has some e excellent you know, partnerships with players around the world. So tell us a little bit about how that's all coming together. Indeed. Gazelle has a world-class board of directors. It was chairman is uh, Dr. Javier Cabada. Um, Javier was former uh, president of Barzilla. He's the CEO of Highview Power, and one of the unicorns in energy storage. Um, he, He's a mentor to me and he knows all the practicalities to introduce a technology as such. 
in the company. Uh, we have other big names as well in the company. Uh, we have um, Connie Hedegaard, uh, she's the former Minister of Energy and Industry from Denmark, ex-commissioner for Climate Action Change. Uh, we have David Mesonero as well. Um, well Connie's helping us to navigate all the, all the policies, all these regulations. Uh, as he has broad experience in the European Union. Uh, David Mesonero, uh, he's the former CFO at Siemens Gamesa. Um, he's part of the Iberdola Renewable, um, Renewables Energy Board, and uh, he's helping us with all the, all, all the more financial part. Uh, Mr. Matza, Pier Paolo Matza, he's a veteran uh, from GE. Uh, he's across uh, his 35 year experience, touched everything but nuclear, over a billion dollars in sales, and a special mention to Dr. Antonio Garcia, who is the, is the godfather of the gazelle. Uh, he's the inventor, he's, he's the genius behind the concept. Um, we've we've uh, talked about him before at the start of this of, of your show in Daniel. Uh, we are supported uh, by uh, Safir Engineering. Uh, these are one of the main specialist offshore uh, structures in Europe. And they've built uh, very significant floating structures uh, worldwide. So now Gesell is setting up a consortia and uh, as part of the first demo that we're putting in water uh, connected to the grid in 2023. And uh, we are seeking to bring on board world-class players, which in the next months uh, we will be able to publicly disclose some of these partnerships. That's terrific. And where do you see the demand for your structures, uh, your floating offshore wind uh, developments being? Have you got a sense of um, the priority markets yet? So let me put in, in context how we see the market evolving. Uh, what we see is uh, most of the developers out there, um, they are um, remaining technology agnostic regarding this type of uh, floaters technology. And what they are doing is for the for a particular site, so for example, for the North Sea or for the Mediterranean Sea or for South Korea, they would be benchmarking uh, the best combination of floater with wind turbine with supply chain. So uh, Gazelle, while it was born in Europe, we have a global ambition. We want to become the global benchmark for floating offshore wind across global markets. And uh, we are developing these relationships with developers uh, in Europe. Uh, US is a market very interesting for us as well, uh, as, well as, as well as Southeast Asia. Uh, we can see all the developments, all what's happening in South Korea, in Japan, in Taiwan. Um, where the, the that, that local authorities are providing that certainty as well, and they are they are defining that clear uh, national role. Very interesting. Um, do you see you know a couple of markets which could be lead markets? Um, I mean, you're based in you know Dubai, and of course they're very um, strongly pushing into renewable energy. Um, is the Middle East a region, or maybe the UK? Do you have sort of a, a sense of where your first projects would come from? Well, the Middle East still needs to first develop the onshore supply chain. There are some pockets of opportunities in the Red Sea, in the Gulf of Oman, but uh, Gazelle is looking uh, at Europe. Of course, Europe has been the market leading. Um, we all heard what Boris Johnson said a few months ago. You, they want to make the UK as the Saudi Arabia of floating offshore wind. And uh, we see also the US with huge interest. Uh, there are some studies out there saying that by 2050, 90% of the uh, electricity uh, could, be, could, be, could be provided by offshore wind. That's very bodacious. And that's at least we're seeing definitely an intent uh, in, their, in the regulators to move forward, to move towards this direction. Uh, so those are some of the markets that uh, we, are, we are already um, seeking and very happy to explore and develop. Uh, that's excellent news. I think those are definitely some of the markets where there's a lot of regulatory support and, and policy support, certainly. Um, <clears throat> so looking forward for the next year, it, when we catch up again, you know, 12 months from now, let's say, what would you hope to have achieved by then? What are the key milestones that you're focused on for the, for the coming 12 months? Uh, at this stage uh, we are in, in Daniel, uh, we've recently achieved the statement of feasibility from DMB. Uh, Gazelle is the first mobile mooring system in the world, which is patented and now certified. So this has been a huge step towards uh, bankability and the risk in the technology. We already performed basing tests 
uh, back in 2019, and now uh, we are performing new vaccines uh, now in the fall of 2021, uh, with the goal very clear to put our first demonstrator by 2023. So now uh, we are at um, a stage that after successful fundraising, uh, we are opening a new uh, series uh, in order to go straight to this demonstrator, procure all the material, uh, fin finalize contracts uh, in order to put that first unit connected to the grid uh, by 2023. That's where our, our target is now, very clear. Well, that is a very focused plan. So I wish you the best of luck with your endeavors. Um, this is, I think a huge opportunity. I think you have a very interesting technology which the industry will be watching. So all the best with uh, your deployment, your fundraising, um, and hope to see you on the show again soon. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Take care, John. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode of Impact Unicorns, don't forget to rate and review this show by scrolling down and clicking Rate This Podcast. And join me next week as I talk to more inspirational entrepreneurs building the next generation of transformative companies.